Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Erie News and today is June 9th, 2022. Thursday, June 9th, 2022. All right, let's get let's go into one of my favorite areas of Erie News which is true crime and this is a uh, kind of like a cold case but you know, it's as a matter of fact, it's pretty cold, but let's get to it. This appeared, this is an article on Erie News, and it's titled, Who's Using the Detroit River as a Dumping Ground for Men's Bodies for the Last 52 Years, but Only in June? Between 1968 to 2015, eight victims have been found in the river. So far, they've all remained unidentified. First one was June 9th, 1968. Uh, victim number one was a white man, age 55 to 65. When his remains were recovered from the Detroit River near Fort Wayne, decomposition had set in, but his death was listed as a homicide. He was 5'7", weighed a little under 200 pounds, and he had a gray hair. And he had gray hair. He wore a blue pea coat, a black shirt over a gray shirt and long johns, black rubbers covered brown shoes, and he wore a gold tone ring with a white stone in his left ring finger. He had been in the water for about a week. June 15th of 1983. 15 years had passed, and the second victim was recovered from the river behind the Detroit Free Press building. He was before, between 40 to 50 years of age, 5 feet 9 inches, and weighed about 180 pounds. Due to decomposition, identification was not possible. He was wearing a green corduroy jacket, and warmer chemical packs were found in the front pocket. Underneath, he had on a blue-gray-red checkered shirt. He had on jeans and gray underwear on his feet were insulated boots with striped so- white socks. On the same day, another man, younger, was recovered from the Detroit River at the foot of Joseph Kampau Avenue. He was also white in his 20s, 5'9", weighing 155 pounds. He had brown curly hair, a sparse goatee, and his eyes were brown. Like the others, identification was not possible due to decomposition. He was wearing a Kmart brand green khaki coat, a branded line blue jean zipper jacket, black long sleeve synthetic shirt size 15-33, gray pants with Scott written on the inside, brief style underwear inscribed with Lewis 31854. His socks were blue and gray and non-matching. He wore wolf style shoe, slip-on shoes size 7.5. June 30th, 1983, two weeks later, a black male, 15 to 25 years old, was found in the river near the foot of Helen Street. Identification, again, could not be completed due to decomposition. He was 5 feet 6 inches, and the weight could not be estimated. He was wearing brown pants, but no shirt or shoes. He had two gold chains around his neck. June 17th, 1990, seven years later, a black male in his 30s was taken from the Detroit River downriver from Lake St. Clair. He had been in the water for days and identification could not be completed because of decomposition. He was 5'10 and weighed 215 pounds. His fingernails were long and he had a scar on his left wrist and a mole on his right thigh. He was wearing only white socks and underwear. June 11, 1994. Four years passed since the last body was found. This time the victim was a white man age 35 to 45. Authorities believed he died either 1993 or 1994 and he came from another country, possibly Russia. He was 5'8", weighed 141 pounds and had brown hair and eyes. Two Moscow subway tokens and a lighter were found near the body. He wore Levi's along with Chinese laundry mark brown sweatpants, a black t-shirt and a blue sweatshirt. He had on a size 24 EE, which is a foreign size, tennis shoes and a belt. Decomposition prevented further identification. June 8, 2006. Twelve years passed until another body was discovered. He was a black male between 40 to 60 years of age. He was found near the Belle Isle Harbor Master Station. Like the others, decomposition had set in and police estimated he could have died in 2005 or 2006. He was 5 feet 7 inches and weighed 190 pounds. June 13, 2015 and for those of you watching the video there's they they sketched him up thankfully this victim and they've also put pictures of his a leather belt he was wearing and some shoes he was a white male taken from the detroit river near the gm renaissance center he could have died in 2014 or 2015 he had partially gray hair cut short he was clean shaven and was wearing diesel in this diesel industry jeans, a white and blue striped button-up shirt, a black leather belt, 
and Hermes brand black leather loafers. The composition did not allow further identification. The Detroit River acts as a border between the United States and Canada and runs for 28 miles because of its location. It is one of the busiest waterways in the country. Now I'm going to go on to, this is, you know, as far as uh, things that end up in the Detroit River, this is another case, but the Detroit River is no stranger to murder victims being thrown into its depths. In July 2012, the bodies of a man and woman were pulled from the Detroit River. Both bodies had been decapitated. The hands and feet had also been cut off. A fisherman discovered a circular saw and a suitcase with body parts inside. He was setting up his fishing gear along the river seawall near Fox Creek when he saw what he described as three legs. The area along the Detroit River is popular with anglers who come during the summer to fish for rock bass and walleye. Fox Creek connects to several narrow canals accessible from residential backyards. The victims were later identified as Chris Hall, 42, and his fiancée, Danielle Greenway, 32. An autopsy found Hall was shot six times, including twice to the head. Greenway was shot once through the mouth. Within days of the discovery of the bodies, Roger Bowling, who was Greenway's ex-boyfriend, was arrested for the crime. The 39-year-old had been staying as a house guest of the couple for only three weeks before he killed them. He had asked Greenway to stay there until he got back on his feet after a run of bad luck. Robert Slick, a former friend and roommate of the accused, testified at a preliminary hearing that Bowling said he would cut Greenway up and place her in a cooler before dumping it in the water. He said he had 10 conversations with Bowling around 2004 where they discussed how they'd get rid of women in their lives. The pair knew each other since grade school. Now, mind you, he had this discussion in 2004 and 2012 is when he actually did something about this. This is this man, that, that's very scary right there. He said that Bowling's anger towards Greenway was fueled because she was dating someone else even though they had broken up five years before. It was believed Bowling used his father's boat to take the bodies out to the river after he shot them at the house they shared. Bowling was charged with two counts of first degree, each of first degree murder and mutilation of a body. In July of 2014, Bowling was found guilty. In October, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Okay, and that's that's a scary looking guy there for you, those of you watching the video. My point is, um, I'm hoping that all these victims, these men that were dumped in there, that uh, it, like always with DNA, and this is the thing, people don't realize that when these bodies they first of all they're all unidentified but at some point nobody's even um there's not even a report how's this for a missing person okay they they could say hey you know what we just got this body and even though it kind of looks this way or whatever we've got a missing person report that kind of fits this person so it's almost like these people they disappear obviously you know, and that nobody cares to even put in a report and say, hey, my my father, my brother, my friend, my cousin, my uncle, my whoever, I haven't seen him anymore. Even if you don't live in the area, that you don't even, let's say, all of a sudden this person at least to call you or you'd see him every few years, something. Nobody, as far as I know, or at least something that they could match to these men and they remain unidentified. Which is kind of it's kind of sad if you think about it. All right, then I'm gonna go. This is I'm gonna stay. Uh, this is also on stranger than fiction stories. Okay, and this is uh this is titled the mysterious berry picker. We're gonna go back a little bit in time, and uh, police get strange reports, especially about dead bodies. Some of them pan out, but a lot don't. So when a berry picker told police he'd come across one by Fresh Pond Road, the information was taken, and a few hours later, a detective was sent out. Okay. And this was, by the way, this is, this happened. This is this is an old story, okay. Following the berry picker's information, Detective Herbert Graham from the Bayside Station went to a thicket south of North Hempstead Turnpike and west of Fresh Pond Road in Flushing, Queens. He found the body, but even stranger, the woman was naked, with her clothing torn to pieces and scattered around her. Her purse containing fifty-three dollars and seventy-nine cents lay near the body. There was no evidence of foul play. But perhaps she'd been killed in a disguised way. If so, robbery was not the motive. The medical examiner quashed any suspicions that she'd been murdered because, according to him, she died of heart disease. Only four days before she'd been treated at the IRT station at 104th Street, Corona, Queens. 
he determined she'd been dead about 24 hours. Then, Jane Hansen went to the police station to report her landlady missing. She then confirmed the woman found in the thicket was Bridget L. Curran of 72, 72 years of age of 133 East 97th Street, Manhattan. She'd been living at this address for 30 years. It was unknown if Mrs. Curran had gone into the thicket to escape the heat of the day or perhaps she felt death coming upon her and just wanted to lay down. But perhaps the biggest mystery of all was the identity of the berry picker who found her and disappeared before police could question him. Did he know anything as to why she was unclothed? Was he even a berry picker? And that's the thing. This lady, apparently, she was having, she was 72, she had heart problems, and who knows, maybe. That's the, because if she, okay, they would have found her clothes. Who took off her clothes and shredded them? Okay. And of course, this this happened like in the 40s, I want to say it was. Um, and obviously, they left $53 in her purse. And, but at that time, they would not have, I don't, you know, the papers were real careful as in if something had been done to that body uh, afterwards, you know, like any type of, you know, like necrophilia along those lines. But yeah, I found that that's very uh, unusual. But anyway, there's other cases that do end up getting resolved. This is out of the New York Post. And this is titled, um, Baby Holly found 41 years after parents murdered in Texas. Uh, an Oklahoma woman has been identified as the infant who made headlines four decades ago when she vanished without a trace during her parents' horrific 1981 murder in Texas, the Lone Star State's Attorney General Office said Thursday. As in today, I believe. Yes, this is this is just breaking news. The infant known as Baby Holly is now a 42-year-old woman who has been able to reconnect with her biological family thanks to DNA tracing that made the connection. Finding Holly is a birthday present from heaven since we found her on her father's birthday, said Holly's biological grandmother, Donnie Casa Santa. I prayed for more than 40 years for answers and the Lord has revealed some of it. We have found Holly. Authorities have been searching for baby Holly since her parents went missing in 1980. Two bodies, believed to be her parents, were found in a wooded area in Houston, but they could not be identified at the time. Tina Gale Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus Jr. had moved from Florida to Texas shortly before they disappeared along with their infant daughter, Holly. When the two bodies were found, the baby was missing. Decades passed before Identifinders International was able to use genetic genealogy in 2021 to positively identify the bodies that were found at the Klauses. Dean had been beaten to death and Tina strangled, according to the Houston Chronicles. The couple's families were notified about the positive ID last year and began searching for Holly. Investigators visited Holly's workplace on Tuesday in Oklahoma and told her the news, reports the Houston Chronicle. Holly, who had recently met her biological family, was raised by a family who adopted her. Her adoptive family are not suspects in the ongoing murder investigation for Holly's parents, the Texas AG's office said Thursday. Baby Holly was left at a church in Arizona and was taken into their care, said Texas First Assistant Attorney General Brent Webster. Two women who identified themselves as members of a nomadic religious group brought Holly to the church. They were wearing white robes and they were barefoot. They indicated that they believe that their beliefs of their religion included the separation of male and female members practicing vegetarian habits and not wearing or using leather goods. The women indicated they had given up a baby before at a laundromat. It is believed that this particular group traveled around the southwestern United States, including Arizona, California, and possibly Texas. There were sightings of this religious group around the Yuma, Arizona area in the early 80s. The women members would be seen around town at various points asking for food. The Texas AG's office also revealed that someone who might be a member of this same cult contacted the dead parents' families in late December 1980 or early 1981. The families of Tina Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus received a phone call from someone identifying herself as Sister Susan, who explained she was calling from Los Angeles, California, and wanted to return Tina and Dean's car to their family said Webster. She further stated that Tina and Dean had joined a religious group and were no longer wanting to have contact with their families. They were also giving up all of their possessions. Sister Susan asked for money in exchange for returning the car to Florida where the family lived. The family agreed to to meet Sister Susan at the Daytona racetrack and contacted local police about the meeting. The family described meeting two different women and possibly one male 
That's weird. Possibly one male. And once again, these women were wearing robes and appeared to be members of a religious group. Webster elaborated, the police reportedly took the women into custody, but there's no record of a police report on file that had been found as of yet. Given the age of this case, that is common. We're still on the hunt for that police report. Yeah, you know what? Unless it's possibly tied to a murder. Come on. The car that was returned was Dean's. It was a 1978 two-door red burgundy AMC Concorde. The Klauses were likely murdered between December 1980 and early 1981, the Texas AG's office believes. Their bodies were dumped in a wooded area near Houston, although the young couple lived in Louisville, Texas, north of Dallas. The Texas AG's office is asking anyone with information to come forward. They would not identify who Holly was and did not give any details about how exactly she got into the hands of the religious group after the killing, which remains unsolved. They also declined to take questions from reporters. Holly's family said they were glad to be reunited. The very first thing that ran through my head when we heard Holly was found was the call that I got eight months ago about my sister's death, her uncle, Les Lynn, said. The juxtaposition of that call with Holly's sudden sudden discovery just popped into my head. To go from hoping to find her to find her suddenly meeting her less than eight months later, how miraculous is that? All the detectives involved, they all express such fortitude to get to the bottom of this case. Even if it's a piece of information that may not be concrete evidence, we need to find pieces of the puzzle to solve this crime. We wish Holly the best. We're grateful that we found her, but we must continue with our purpose of finding who murdered this couple, said Webster. The investigation into Holly's biological parents' murder is ongoing, and the Texas Attorney General's office is asking anyone with the information to contact its Cold Case and Missing Persons Unit at coldcaseunit at oag texas.gov or at 512-936-0742 again you know dna helped to and what i'm curious about is you know how did they if the if, if, if this couple was murdered in some wooded area and there's this little baby you know who who else unless the somebody that was involved in the murder and i'm very curious um you know, why, I guess, my, I guess my question is, why weren't they able to, how can I say it, why weren't they able to identify the parents originally? Because one thing is, when they suspect we know who this is, but, but, I mean, was it, was it a long time before, well, I guess, well, if they, if they, yeah, that makes sense, if they, they weren't even sure of the date of the murder, then they probably were decomposed, but, yeah. Okay, so much for cults. All right, next story. Let's get on. This is out of the Daily Beast, and it's titled, Is This New York City Restaurant Haunted by a Very Exclusive Ghost? Okay, here we go. I'll never leave this place. Glenn Birnbaum, owner of the exclusive New York City restaurant Mortimer's, repeatedly told me as his friend and attorney. In the small hours of September 8, 1998, Glenn died with his boots on, peering into his murky bathroom mirror, suddenly stricken by liver failure. He keeled over backwards, smashing his head against the tiled wall. During all his shaves and showers, he had never thought a bath mat would be his last stand, and Glenn did not go gentle into that good night. He landed on his back in the tub, and in that instant, Klaus von Bülow, Henry Kissinger, Dominic Dunn, Bill Blas, Kenny Lane, Nan Kempner, Elizabeth Taylor, Jackie O, and glossy luminaries of all shapes and sizes were no longer going to toss their salads, over Palm Beach gossip and Locust Valley plants at lunch. For more than 20 years, Mortimer's had been a magnet for everybody who was anybody. Now Mortimer's would be closed, shuttered forever. My only specific instruction, as recited in Glenn's last will and testament, which I painstakingly drafted, was the minute I die, close Mortimer's, padlock the front door. At 7 a.m. that day, I was called by Mortimer's charming, battle-scarred maitre d' Robert C., informing me of Glenn's death. Robert, not through eavesdropping, directly knew I had discussed the end many times with Glenn at Mortimer's during our late afternoon meetings dating back to the 80s. Glenn would call after lunch, Mr. Golub, if you have nothing better to do, come over and let's talk about my estate. I need a new will. Later in life, I learned that nearly everyone needs a new will because so many heirs proved to be undeserving. Whatever I had on my plate that day was not going to be as much fun as talking to Glenn about his testament plus anything else under the sun, including his favorite subject, his net worth. There were more stories in his repertoire than socialites in his address book, and many of their travails were part of our consultations. 
Needless to say, everybody who was anybody ate or wanted to eat at Mortimer's. In one will that endured for ten years, several others followed it. He bequeathed all of his worldly possessions to the animals in the Bronx Zoo. I urged them to be specific, but he refused to name any of them personally. In a will supposedly drafted in the late 70s by Ro- Roy Kahn, no longer Esquire at that point, Glenn named Metro de Stefanos Zachariatis as his sole heir. However, after Stefano was convicted of plotting to murder Glenn, in order to expedite his inheritance, there was more than ample reason to draft a new document. On the day of Glenn's death, after I arrived at Mortimer's to fulfill his instructions, stopping on the way at Lexington's hardware to purchase a large padlock and six feet of chain, I was escorted to his private rooms above the restaurant by the police. A burly 19th precinct cop stood guard inside the apartment in front of the bathroom and presumptively briefed me. There is no evidence of foul play. The fall audition for law and order continued. The bodies behind that door. Mr. Birnbaum is dead. I would have to take his word for it. No civilian would be permitted to see the corpse, although when it comes to drafting wills and the eventual follow-up, I usually like to observe the cadaver or the mortua persona, professional courtesy, no charge. Glenn and I didn't have much in common, but we were good friends, probably because I grew up in a tenement right above my father's grocery store. The food business is a tie that binds. Every time I pass or say in the past few years, known for its fine French cuisine, Frenchified bistro decor, and for taking over Mortimer's space, I sensed a nudge towards the front door. Think Pacino and Godfather 3. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. As time went by, the corner of Lexington and East 75th Street was getting more difficult to avoid. Early this April, I relented and decided to have lunch at Orsay without a reservation. Upon my arrival, Olivier, the gray-suited maitre d', unhesitatingly guided me to the left. It was a room where I always met with Glenn. An Olivier outstretched hand indicated the precise banquet and table. Naturally, I sat there. After the usual acclamation, I ordered the grilled Scottish salmon fillet, a frise salad, and a glass of iced tea. I'm on a strict diet, but I oddly hesitated and considered the chicken hash or the famous Mortimer's twin burgers, because I heard Glenn's unmistakably gravelly voice confirming, They are to this day the best thing on the menu. I whispered, Stop it, Glenn. The kitchen is closed. The waitress, an attractive brunette named Devon in her twenties, brought me the iced tea. It was then I felt compelled to tell her who I was, along with an impress- irrepressible need to talk about Mortimer and Glenn. I wasted no time informing her how he'd passed away and that I closed the place. I included the fact that Glenn died upstairs. Then unconsciously I muttered, if these walls could talk. Devon didn't hesitate. You mean the old man upstairs? I've seen him walking around with his cane. His hand is always trembling. I know he's the owner. I mean, was the owner a long time ago. I recognize him. I asked, did you know the upstairs? Now the events room was Glenn's apartments? She simply said yes and walked away. After that revelation, I idiotically looked around for the old man, telling myself to eat and leave while I nervously picked away at the salmon. My appetite was gone. Minutes later, Devon returned, accompanied by another waitress, who couldn't wait to tell me something. I have seen the old man many times upstairs. It is scary to go up there because he is walking around, and there's a lot of activity up there. Even the exterminator talks about seeing him. He's here in the morning, and you can come and speak to him. A few days later, in furtherance of my research into the occult, I enjoyed another lunch at Orsay. This time, I spoke to Claudio, the Wednesday maitre d', who, in a businesslike fashion, informed me, I have seen the old man. He's always wearing a dark suit. Upstairs he's walking around. I can hear him. His image appears on the restaurant security cameras. Even the exterminator, still nameless, has seen him early in the morning. He goes into the party room and disappears. The whiskey bottles, wine glasses, on the bar late at night sometimes make noise. They touch each other, clinking. I don't pay attention because if I do, the rattling becomes more intense. If that didn't stop Tales from the Crypt, my my waiter, Ryan, who looked like a part-time GQ model, added out of earshot of Claudia. There was a Bengali busboy here who said during the early pandemic that he saw the old man and heard the serenading bar bottles and glass. I'm planning to bring a Ouija board to work very soon, and let's see. Now I'm determined to find the old man in the suit. This isn't my first rodeo. When it comes to earring and weird, psycho actor Tony Perkins was my brother-in-law. Norman Bates would insist that I go upstairs at Orsay and bring a mother and Glenn their dinner. Very interesting. That That's an excellent story about, and you know, let's face it, that guy, when somebody tells his attorney, hey, when I die, the first thing I want you to do is padlock, <laughs> padlock the front door. That, that That's his place. And like, if I'm not there, that's it. End of, end of the story. 
All right, let's go on to the next story. This is out of Insider and is titled Burnt Out Catholic Exorcist Complain. They face long lines of possessed people and little support from bishops. Wow. A Vatican-approved religious university in Rome held an exorcism. Wow, with 120 participants? i got to look at that. Okay, a survey from a Vatican-approved religious university in Rome found that Catholic exorcists feel overworked and undersupported by bishops. Italian exorcists spoke to researchers at Regina Apostolorum's 16th annual exorcism course in Rome attended by 120 participants. The course attracted a significant crowd thanks to Pope Francis' support of exorcism. He had previously spoken about helping those who are possessed by evil and made exorcism an official Catholic practice. The conference's exorcists said that they need more support from psychologists to determine whether people are mentally unstable or demonically possessed. Father Giuseppe Bernardi claimed to have performed a nine-hour exorcism on a woman who hurled abuse in Latin and assaulted the monks. The woman's father thought she was suffering from a psychiatric problem, but the mother and later Bernardi believed she was possessed by a demonic influence. Bernardi said he had to seek help from psychologists to determine whether she was disturbed or possessed, but did so without the help of the church. The lack of support from bishops is a grievance echoed by other surveyed exorcists. They complained about receiving little help and exercising the long lines of Catholics claiming satanic possession. Exorcists also said they have been tasked with conducting exorcism on people with COVID-19. Participants at the conference claimed that demonic possession could be recognized by unusual physical strength, vomiting, or sudden ability to speak Latin, Hebrew, or Aramaic. Italy has 290 exorcists, and there were 37 in Spain, the survey found. Many of the potentially possessed people they see in Spain have spent time with New Age spiritual or meditation groups, researchers said. In the UK and Ireland, there were 28 working exorcists, and in Manila, the Philippines, there was a dedicated office and staff. What does dedicated mean? Now, I'm surprised because I always thought that the Catholic Church would not okay an exorcism until they had determined. In other words, they had ruled out uh, mental illness, but I, but they're being overwhelmed, so they're just skipping over that part. As you would think, you know, that, that would be the first thing that this person has just got a mental illness. But and there was one um, one of the times there was the there's a very famous exorcism, which is Annalise, the the girl out of Germany, that uh, I believe her parents and the priest that did the exorcism. She died. Uh, she uh, she had I th- she had severe mental illness, but uh, bottom line, she she died. She was like anorexic, like no. Well, when I mean anorexic, she had she was genuflecting a bunch of times. She just it was totally horrible. But anyway, one of the criticisms that they said was that in the case of mental illness, in other words, that she started talking about being possessed after it was suggested. In other words, she overheard it or it was suggested that. She was possessed. You understand? So and it's almost like, okay, don't don't put the cart before the horse. You know, don't suggest to somebody who might have a mental illness that, that they're possessed because they could hang on to that. And all of a sudden, they're convinced that they are possessed versus maybe all they have is just they need, they need medication and or, you know, therapy. Well, let's go on to... The next, this is out of the Tryon Daily Bulletin. All right, this is a two-part story. This is really interesting. It's titled, Mysterious Low-Flying Plane as Landrum Residents Curious. All right. Now, this first story is dated just a week ago, June 2nd. And it starts off, Landrum. On Tuesday afternoon, several Landrum residents reported seeing a large airplane flying only hundreds of feet above part of Landrum. Witnesses say they saw the large plane flying extremely low and turning toward town. Jason Turn of Landrum says he saw the airplane landing at Fairview Airport in Campobello just beside I-26, stating he was on Airport Road in Campobello when he saw the plane land around 4 p.m. Other witnesses, Chris and Rita Cochran of Landrum, say they saw the low-flying plane circling town in the early afternoon. It was a big one, Cochran says, stating that this airplane looked like the ones that land at Greenville Spartanburg International Airport. I saw it landing. Witnesses' description of the airplane's match all agree that the plane was large and white. All witnesses claim the airplane had a cargo-type look and was not commercial. Cochran, who saw the plane flying over her house, says it was 200 feet high maximum. I mean, the trees are 60 feet tall and that plane was right on them. It was no more than 200 feet. 
Three out of four witnesses claim to have seen the airplane around 1.30 p.m., while Turner, who saw it landing, says it was around 4 p.m. How low it was looked like an emergency, he says. An employee at Fairview Airport in Campobello, however, was unable to track down the airplane, claiming there was no emergency landing at all. The employees requested to remain anonymous. There was no emergency response activity here, he says. I did observe an airplane come in and land, and it went to the other end of the runway and took back took back off again. The picture of the airplane that he shared from video surveillance was a small single-engine Cessna differing from what witnesses say they saw Tuesday afternoon. It's unlikely that any cargo-type plane could land at this airport, he says. It would end up crashing off the runway. The airport worker, using surveillance footage, was able to find that the single-engine plane made its brief appearance on the runway at 1.19 p.m. He says there was no activity around 4 p.m. that day. It is very common for planes to land and take off here because here's not a lot of air traffic, so that was nothing out of the ordinary, the worker says. After showing witnesses a photo of the single-engine Cessna that landed at Fairview Airport, they each agree that was not the large cargo-style plane they witnessed. The employee from the airport says distance can make an illusion of the size of the plane. The airport worker was unable to find any record of a large plane landing at Fairview Airport and witnesses still have unanswered questions about the mysterious low-flying airplane. Okay. Which is, in other words, these people are saying we saw something or this this certain type of plane and that's a, that's a pretty hard thing to mistake. Now, fast forward. This is dated June 7th. Mysterious airplane. Con- this is also out of the Tryon Daily Bulletin. Okay. Um, and it's titled, Mysterious Airplane Continues to Raise Questions in the Area. Somebody took a picture of it for those of you watching the video portion of it. Yeah, that, that does not look like a Cessna. But anyway. Um, mysterious low-flying airplane that locals witnessed flying over land from other parts of our area has continued to raise questions for residents. On Tuesday afternoon, Landrum residents Chris and Rita Cochran saw a large, white, low-flying airplane rising, flying only hundreds of feet over their house. Rita says it was 200 feet high maximum. Chris says that once the plane flew over Landrum, it appeared to circle back towards Columbus. Jason Turner, a Campobello resident, was on an airport road in Campobello when he claims to have seen the cargo-looking plane airplane land at Fairview Airport, though a worker at the airport says he has no record of that plane's appearance. The worker says that a plane of that size would end up crashing off the runway. As of press last, as of press time last week, there were four known witnesses who saw the airplane. Since then, many more have reached out saying they saw that either saw or heard the aircraft. There were reported sightings in Mill Spring, Campobello, Landrum, Inman, Green Creek, Lynn, and White Oak Mountain. Those who saw it described the same aircraft white and cargo type low flying with no markings. Jennifer Wilson of Columbus says it was large and white and looked like a cargo type plane matching each witness's description. Some say it was so loud it sounded like it was going to crash. An anonymous resident of Columbus says he was inside of his house and heard the plane thinking it was just another thunderstorm. He ran outside and said the sound was roaring. My God, where is that plane headed? He said he thought it's just roared something awful. I've never heard one that loud, that close. I'm surprised it cleared the mountains. Another anonymous witness in Mill Spring says that the noise rattled his dishes in his house. Sandra Nicholson says it was so loud in Lynn you could feel it. According to FAA, aircraft legally cannot be operated closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. Despite FAA guidelines for low-flying airplanes, many witnesses claim the plane flew only hundreds of feet from their houses. Teresa Owens, who was traveling on I-385 and getting off the fountain in excess, says she saw it flying below 500 feet. Rita Cochran also agrees that the plane was a mere 200 feet from the ground. As I saw it coming, I thought, oh my God, this plane is going to crash, Owens said. It leaned sideways like it was going to turn. Had it gone totally sideways, the wings would have touched the trees. Owens says she spotted the plane at exactly 2.48 p.m. I kept thinking to myself, this just isn't normal. Something's wrong. Owen says, it kept veering like it was turning, and all you saw was the top of the plane and white wings spread out. There was no marking on the top, not at all. She says, I definitely would have liked to have some answers on something. It obviously didn't crash, and it obviously was flying undetected. Witness Mackenzie Hall was on White Oak Mountain when she saw the large plane and snapped a picture of it from above. It was huge, she says. White Oak Mountain is approximately over 2,000 feet high, and Hall says she was looking down on the airplane. 
After seeing this picture that Hall took of the plane, the Fairview Airport employee says, that airplane did not land at Fairview. The only thing I can conclude from this picture is that it is a plane that has a prominent tail structure that doesn't appear to have a horizontal wing on top of the tail structure. That is something not much that is something not much. It's a plane that the wings are underneath the body of the plane, so I can tell you it's not like a C-130 because the shape is all wrong. This is a developing story. Okay. And I'm going to follow it because I think, where is this thing coming from or where is it? Okay, obviously, it's unmarked. Is this a ghost plane? Is this a somebody going around... Uh, I don't know. I I I I really don't know. That that that's I'm gonna follow up on that because and so many people see it and, and everybody agrees that it's large, it's a cargo like plane with no markings, flying very low to the ground, and it almost and it sounds like it's about to crash. Interesting. I wonder if anybody's gonna do the due diligence and check back to see if there's ever an airplane crash of that type in the past. Okay, then our next story is out of the Daily Mail. And it's titled, The Best Find Since the Marie Rose. Amateur divers discover awe-inspiring wreck of royal warship dubbed HMS Calamity. I'm going to stop right here because I have to put my two cents worth. I would never get on a ship called the HMS Calamity. I made this comment when there, when I was doing the story on the two, the ones that were in Antarctica, the HMS Terror, Terror and the Erebus. I would not get on the HMS Terror. And I would not have gotten on the HMS Calamity either. Okay. Getting back to it. The wreck of the Royal Warship dub HMS Calamity, which sunk off 28 miles off Great Yarmouth in 1682 with the future King James II on board, then kept it secret for 15 years. The wreck of the HMS Gloucester, a Royal Warship that sank 340 years ago while carrying the future King James Stuart, has finally been found off the coast of Norfolk. The outstanding ship, which sank on May 6, 1682 after hitting the Norfolk sandbanks in the southern North Sea, was uncovered 28 miles off the coast of Great Yarmouth, half buried on the seabed. But the find was kept secret until now to conserve the ship. Efforts to locate that the wreck, led by brothers Julian and Lincoln Barnwell, proved successful after four years' search covering 5,000 nautical miles. Plans are underway to exhibit artifacts on board the ship that have been brought to land, including clothes, wine, bottles, and the ship's bell, used to conclusively confirm the wreck was the Gloucester. The exhibition jointly curated by the University of East Anglia Norfolk Museum Service, will be staged for five months at Norwich Castle Museum and Art Gallery from spring next year. The ship itself is fragmented and still on the sea floor, and authorities say there are currently no plans to bring any parts of the remains to land. HMS Gloucester represents an almost moment in British political history as it nearly caused the death of the Catholic heir to the Protestant throne at a time of great political and religious tension. James Stewart, later James II of England, survived the sinking, but up to 250 sailors and passengers lost their lives, largely due to his actions. James barely survived, having delayed abandoning ship until the last minute, needlessly costing the lives of between 130 and 250 people on board who, because of protocol, could not abandon the ship before royalty. Uh, wow. Now, that's interesting. They have, the disaster was witnessed by diarist Samuel Pepys, who was, another vis, who was on another vessel in the fleet. He wrote a harrowing account of victims and survivors being picked up half dead from the water. Professor Claire Jowett, a maritime history expert at the University of East Anglia, has called it the most important maritime discovery since the Mary Rose, the warship from the Tudor Navy of King Henry VIII. The Mary Rose sank in battle in the Solent in 1545 and was raised in 1982, later being put on display in Portsmouth. The discovery promises to fundamentally change understanding of the 17th century social, maritime, and political history, Professor Jowett said. It is an outstanding example of underwater cultural heritage of national and international importance. Because of the circumstances of its sinking, this can be claimed as the single most significant historic maritime discovery since the raising of the Mary Rose in 1982. The explorers discovered the wreck in June of 2007 after a four-year search covering 500 nautical miles. The brothers, printers by trade, hid the find for 15 years to keep it safe from treasure hunters as it was in international waters. Lincoln 51 said they had decided to hunt for the vessel after reading about it in a book in 2003. But they were beginning to give up hope after four fruitless years and traveling 5,000 nautical miles. It was our fourth dive season looking for Gloucester, he said. We were starting to believe that we were not going to find her. We dived so much and just found sand. 
my descent to the seabed, the first thing I spotted were large cannons lying on the white sand. It was awe-inspiring and really beautiful. It instantly felt like a privilege to be there. It was so exciting. We were the only people in the world at that moment in time who knew where the luck ray. That was special, and I'll never forget it. Our next job was to identify the site as the Gloucester. In 2012, one of the rescued finds, the ship's bell, manufactured in 1681, was used by the receiver of wreck and Ministry of Defense to conclusively confirm the wreck was the Gloucester. It is now only... It is only now, 10 years on, that the ship's discovery can be made public, largely due to the need to protect an at-risk site which lies in international waters. However, the exact location of the wreck is protected and still cannot be disclosed. Okay. It was our fourth dive season looking for Gloucester, said Lincoln Barwell, who led efforts along with his brother Julian. We were starting to believe that we were not going to find her. We dived so much and just found sand. On my descent to the seabed, the first thing I spotted were large cannons laying on white sand. It was awe-inspiring and really beautiful. Blah, blah, blah. They already did. Okay. The Barnwell brothers found the wreck site with their late father, Michael, and two friends, including James Little, a former Royal Navy submar submariner and diver. Submariner and diver. The ship was found split down the keel with the remains of the hull submerged in the sand. As well as the receiver of wreck and Ministry of Defense, the wreck has been declared to historic England. Artifacts rescued and conserved from the wreck include clothes and shoes, navigational and other professional naval equipment, personal possessions, and many wine bottles. One of the bottles bears a glass seal with the crest of the Legg family, ancestors of George Washington, the first U.S. president. The Legg family crest was a forerunner to the Stars and Stripes flag. There were also some unopened bottles with wine still inside offering opportunities for future research. Oh, interesting. Next year's exhibition, entitled The Last Voyage of the Gloucester, Norfolk's Royal Shipwreck, will display finds from the wreck and share ongoing historical, scientific, and archaeological research. Ultimately, researchers want to shed more light on the identity and lives of those who sadly lost their lives. A tragedy of considerable proportions in terms of loss of life, both privileged and ordinary, the full story of the Gloucester's last voyage and the impact of its aftermath needs to be telling, including its cultural and political importance and legacy. Professor Jowett said, We will also try to establish who else died and tell their stories, as the identities of a fraction of the victims are currently known. Of course, because when you're a nobody, you don't make the, uh, what is it, the records of the ship. All right. Well, that is it for today, and I will see you soon with more eerie and weird news. So until then, take care.